we are now on to the last section of this chapter discussing the Poisson process and the Poisson probability distribution. So, X is said to follow a Poisson, a Poisson distribution with parameter mu, or uh, if the probability mass function of X is given by P of X parameterized by mu, this is equal to e to the power negative mu, mu to the power x over x factorial for uh, x being uh, a member of the set 0, 1, 2, and so on. So in other words, if, if x is a whole number, if x is a whole number, then this is the probability mass function, otherwise it's 0. So the first question you may ask, is this a valid PMF? The answer is yes. And why is that? Well, let's sum the probability mass function from x, uh, sorry, from x uh, uh, equals 0 to infinity. We got p of x parameterized by mu. This is equal to the sum from x equals 0 to infinity e negative mu mu to the x over x factorial. The e to the negative mu part, that is effectively a constant, so that can be pulled out. So we could say that this is e to the negative mu, and then we have the sum from x equals 0 to infinity mu to the x over x factorial. And that part, which I have highlighted in red, that is e to the power mu. Why? Calculus 2. This is the, if I remember right, the Taylor expansion of the function e to the power x. So this is coming from calculus 2. But yeah, that evaluates to e to the mu. Hence, we get e negative mu, e to the power mu, and those are that equals 1. And furthermore, this probability mass function is positive everywhere. So we get this is a valid PMF. So uh, Poisson random variables. If x is following a Poisson distribution with parameter mu, then the expected value of x is equal to mu, and also the variance of x is equal to mu. So that means that we are parameterizing Poisson random variables by their mean. Uh, so in uh, uh, in your book, uh, if you're using the uh, the Devore book, Table 8.2 contains the CDF of select Poisson random variables, or uh, select Poisson distributions. Uh, in R, the functions that are responsible for handling Poisson random variables, random variables, sorry, are dpois, uh, ppois, qpois, and rpois handling probability mass function, CDF, quantiles, and random, and random variates. So in other words, creating random instances of Poisson random variables. And they will be parameterized by their mean. So the Poisson distribution describes uh, random variables that follow the Poisson process. Uh, so here is the intuition of Poisson random variables. They are... Uh, tracking how many times within some, how often a quote unquote rare event occurs within a finite span of time. So, and, which isn't at all clear from looking at this probability mass function that that would be, in fact, be the interpretation. Uh, this is more of a limiting result. This uh, footnote that I have right here actually gives a little bit more justification as to why this is the case. But you can think of it as, all right, we have some rare event. Uh, me, like, <laughs> I have a favorite example that was used by my uh, 3070 instructor. Maybe I'll just pull up his web page for you. Uh, like, I, he, he's got some, he's got some interesting stuff on his on his web page uh, that even now, I kind of look back to it and uh, like I think about it and I just kind of. I kind of want to update it. I think, I think it could be updated. But there's some interesting stuff there, genuinely. 
So math.utah.edu slash tilde Treyberg. Uh, his name was uh, Andres Treyberg's uh, professor at the U. Not actually a probability uh, professor. That's not his uh, area of expertise, although he's taught Math 70 a few times and Math the. Uh, no, Math 3070, sorry. And Math 3080 a few times. And like he, he's interested in statistics, but he is a. Uh, what what is that area of study of his? I think it's like analytic geometry. I think that's what he studies. So I wonder what happens if I just go straight here. We could probably find from here uh, his uh, 3070 page. Yes, I think this is. I think this is it. Math 3070 fall 2013. Math 3070 fall 2012 was the last that was the class that I took. This was my web page. This is where I went to find his stuff. So yeah, I, I took Math 3070 in this class, I think. I'm pretty sure that's true. Alright. If I scroll down, yeah, the supplementary materials. Oh yeah, so here's a simple R uh which it, by John Verzani. This is the uh, lab textbook for the R lab and uh, several example problems. He's got this one. Let's find it. Let's see. Prussian. No, no. Press. Uh, poise. Ah, let's see. Is this it? I think this is it. I think this is it. Uh, are there horse kicks? <laughs> are, are, are people getting kicked by horses? That's what I want to know. I think this is, I think this is it. Um, I don't think so. I don't think this is the horse kick example, but the horse kick example is fun. <laughs> I, Let's see. Oh, why would I want to close that web page? Uh, if we try horse, come on. Aha! There it is. There it is. The horse kick example. Ah, uh, I, yeah, I love this one. Yeah. So, so have a look at this. But basically, it turned out that in the Prussian army, um. You can model the number of people who died from horse kicks with uh, Poisson random variables. Uh, that Poisson random variables actually do a good job of modeling stuff like that. But I also had, as uh, potential examples, I'm not entirely sure how the, how accurate this is. But you could maybe like maybe think of the uh, number of calls that a call center is getting in a day. Or the number of points that's scored by a team in a game uh, as uh, Poisson random variables so and also as being a poisson process a poisson process uh is a bit more general than that so a poisson process is a stochastic process stochastic processes are uh, not the subject of this class beyond this little description uh, i think another thing that could be considered a poisson process or that could be modeled by a Poisson random variable is let's say you have some radioactive matter and the number of, uh, is it atoms? I'm not sure. I'm not very good at physics, but some, some particles are leaving the radioactive mass and the amount of particles that are leaving the mass, uh, over some period of time can be understood as a Poisson random variable and also as a Poisson process. So I have this, uh, R code that's meant to simulate a Poisson process. And with a Poisson process, the time at which a particle, or, or the time at which uh, the, pro the process jumps is random. So it will, so there are going to be random times at which the process increases its value by one. So uh, it will jump, uh, so you'll wait for a period of time and then suddenly the process will jump and Basically, something has left. And then you'll wait a little longer and something else has happened. Maybe you could imagine this as being uh, points in a game, maybe a basketball game. Although, I 
you could probably see why it's a little bit inaccurate to view points in basketball game as a Poisson process because there's no way that you could well, I guess this is possible if maybe if maybe you said both teams uh if you're counting like total points scored by either team, I don't know. It it seems unreasonable though. Uh but you could but basically at random times this process is going to jump uh by one and the value of the process is going to increase. And basically at any fixed time, the value of the process at a fixed time uh, so you fix it at two at two or something, and the value of the process at that time can be modeled by a Poisson random variable. So, yeah, that's uh, that, hopefully that gives you some idea of what they're what they're describing. Uh, how often some event occurs over a fixed period of time, um, which in principle that event could be unbounded. There's an infinite number of poss- uh, it could happen. Like, there's no upper bound on how many times this event could happen. It can happen an infinite number of times. There's, well, okay, maybe not literally infinite, but any large number of times. It's highly unlikely that it will be very large, but there is no upper bound. Right, so you're not going to restrict it. Like, the number of points that you could score in a basketball game, like, there's no there's no limit on that. N- no one will just end the game. Well, I don't know, maybe, but that's that seems that seems rather academic. But, yeah, that's... So this is going to be a random variable that is uh, defined for, or where its probably mass function is going to be positive for uh, all whole numbers. So let's go ahead and see some examples of working with Poisson processes. Let's keep talking about the process. Uh, I haven't really said enough about this yet to start working on examples. So, uh, the Poisson distribution describes random variables that follow Poisson process. This process describes the number of times an event occurs over an interval of time. You can imagine this process as being indexed by T. So, going back to this graph, you can ask, what is the value of this process at time 1.5? So, at time 1.5, the value of the process will be 1. All right, what's the value of this process at time 2.73? That's about here, and the val- and the process is valued at 3. So with a Poisson process, we get to say that at any fixed time t, uh, the value of the process can be, ra- can be modeled by a Poisson uh, random variable with these parameters. In other words, if we call the process xt, indexing this process by time then xt follows a poisson distribution uh, with parameter alpha t so alpha t will be the mean of the process alpha is uh, alpha is what's known as the rate parameter it it is capturing how so if in unit time so t equals one what will be the average number of occurrences? So that's the rate at which occurrences are coming. Uh, that's So basically, if you want to interpret alpha, set t equal to 1, and that is the average number of times that you will see this event occur, whatever event that it is that you're tracking with the Poisson process um, uh, in uh, that entire period of time. Okay, so uh, let's see an example. Example 19. On average, your daughter's soccer team scores 10 points per game, assuming that the number of points scored per game by her team uh, follows a Poisson process. Uh, So we need to figure out what this alpha parameter of the Poisson process is. For that, we're going to use the fact that on average, her team scores 10 points per game. That means when t equals 1, mu, which equals alpha t, which is equal to alpha because t is equal to 1, is going to be 10. Therefore, the uh, that means that the alpha parameter, the rate parameter, is 10. All right, so what is the probability her team will score 7 points during the game? Uh, the random variable in question is x1 where t equals 1, this represents an entire game. 
So x1 follows a Poisson distribution with parameter 10. So what is the probability the te her team will score exactly 7 points during the game? That's the probability that x1 is equal to 7. The probability that x1 is equal to 7 is going to be e uh, negative mu, so that's 10, uh, 10 to the power x, which, so this is, so this will be 7, over 7 factorial. And that number is going to be uh, 0 0.090 approximately, so approximately 0, 0.0. Nine zero. How do we know that? We'd go to uh, we would go to uh, let's say R. All right, we're done with this. All right, so we got uh, we're going to be using the depoise function because that's the probability mass function. Uh, I guess the lambda parameter corresponds to the mean. So we're going to say uh, x is equal to 7 and lambda is equal to 10 and yeah, 0 0.090. All right. Uh, what is the probability that half of your daughter's team, uh, no, that by halftime, my apologies, by halftime your daughter's team will have scored two points? There might Put that little oh there it is okay all right what is the probability that they've scored two points by halftime okay so in this case pay attention to the indexing now we're talking about the random variable x 0 0.5 because t equals 0 0.5 corresponds to halftime in this uh imperfect mathematical model uh, so the distribution of x0.5 will be a Poisson distribution with times 10. Which, for what it's worth, is going to be 5. <laughs> so that will be 5. So we're asking for the probability that x at 0 0.5 is equal to 2. All right, so that's e negative 5. 5 squared over 2 factorial. And then we go to R. All right, let's go ask R what number that is. D uh 2 lambda equals 5, 0 0.08. So the probability of this is going to be about 0 0.08. Uh, what else? Uh, 0 0.084. Uh, next one. What is the probability your daughter's team will score between 3 and 6 points inclusively during the game? So again, we're working with the random variable x1. And we're asking, what is the probability that 3 is less than or equal to x1? which is less than or equal to 6. So for that, we could say that this is the CDF. Uh, let's say, let's call that f of x1. That will be the CDF of x1. So this is the CDF at 6 minus the CDF for x1 at uh, 3 minus 1, which is the CDF at 6 minus the CDF at 2. And for that, we will go to R and calculate that number. So, D po oh, no, 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 not depoise anymore because we're using the CDF. So, poise at uh, 6 and then minus poise at 2. Oh, is that not your second parameter by default? That's dumb. Fine, 
Fine, I will say that that's Lambda. All right. Uh oh. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Wait a minute. Something's. Oh, I set lambda equals two on that one. That's why. You don't get negative probabilities, kids. So if you get a negative probability, you did something wrong. All right. So the answer is point one two seven. Okay. So the answer is point one two seven. All right. Uh, next one. What is the probability your daughter's team will score more than three points in the last half of the game? Okay, here's the thing. What I'm actually asking about is x1 minus x 0 0.5. That's the random variable that I'm actually dealing with. Now, looking back at this, this uh, visual description of a Poisson process, you should, be, you should guess that Poisson processes do not decrease. It is impossible for them to decrease because they're tracking how often an event occurs and you don't all of a sudden lose a previous occurrence of that event. All right, so that's fair. Uh, but that still doesn't quite answer the question of what is the distribution of the of, of a Poisson process when you subtract the value of, a, of the process uh, at an earlier point in time from a later point in time. So in other words, track how much the process has increased over some span of time. So we're going to use this fact and I'm going to have to introduce some additional notation. So we'll say that T1 is less than T2. Then the, pro the value of the process at T2 minus the value of the process at t1 is equal in distribution. All right, I'll explain that in a second. It's equal in distribution to the value of the process at t2 minus t1, at time t2 minus t1, which for what it's worth is following a Poisson distribution with, param with mean parameter alpha times T2 minus T1. All right, getting back to this idea of equal in distribution. I'm going to need some more, oops, I don't want to erase yet. I'm going to need some more space. Uh, we say that a random variable X is equal in distribution to a random variable Y if the probability that X is in some set A is equal to the probability that Y is in subset A. So in other words, the two random variables are not necessarily required to be equal to each other. They're required to have the same probability distribution. And that's what it means to be equal in distribution, right? They don't have to literally be equal. That's why we don't say that they're equal. We say that they're equal in distribution because their distributions are the same. In this case, there's a lot of ways to uh, rephrase what I have right here. Like what I have written down is probably the most general way to describe equal in distribution. It's like the most mathematically acceptable way to describe it. But you could also say that in this case, if their probability mass functions are the same, then the two random variables have the same distribution and therefore are equal in distribution. Or you could say if their CDFs are the same, actually this is true for any random variable. If any two random variables have the same CDFs, then those two random variables are equal in distribution. You could say, um, I, well, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, the cases that you've seen so far, uh, if we were to talk about uh, say, a continuous random variables, two continuous random variables that have the same probability density function except at a countable number of points, uh, those would be equal in distribution to each other as well. So random variables that have equal distribution, have the same mean, uh, same probability mass function, same CDF, all that stuff, which means that 
uh, this random variable, uh, x1 minus x0.5, uh, it's almost as if when you have a Poisson process and you ask what is the value of this, so, so, so if you have a Poisson process and you forget the value of the process up uh, after a certain point and then also subtract its value at that point so that you now are dealing with uh, so now that the place so now the process looks like this you're looking at a similar process so poisson processes are continually restarting uh, and that that's another thing you um if you are at this point in time right here 0 0.5 it doesn't really tell you anything Knowing that you have waited uh, t, uh, t moments of time for an event to occur only tells you that it took at least t moments in time for that event to occur. It doesn't really tell you whether any you are, I mean, I guess you're literally closer to when the event occurs, but the distribution of the time until you re until that event actually occurs is exactly the same as it was once you started waiting t minute t moments ago so you actually don't really have any new information about when that process is going to occur or when that event is going to occur another term for this is that poisson processes are memoryless they're memoryless because they don't care how long they have waited in order to jump they don't care how long they waited uh, every every moment in time, the process effectively restarts, which is kind of a funny thing. Uh, you actually have already encountered a memoryless process, the process of flipping coins until you get heads. Suppose you flip a coin, and you and your first flip is tails. How many flips do you need in order to get to a head? Well. If you flip the coin and you got tails, you're right back where you started and you've ba made basically no pro progress because these flips are independent of each other. Hence, the process is memoryless because the coins don't actually care. This notion that, uh, like, it feels like you kind of want to say you're a little bit closer to getting ahead. And while that's literally true, um, you really don't, you can't really describe probabilistically, like, how much closer you are. Your ba the, the distribution of the next flip is exactly the same. Like you already had a half uh, a 50-50 chance of getting ahead on the first flip, but you got a tail. So what are the odds of getting a 50-50? Uh, what, what are the odds of getting ahead on the second flip? 50-50. So you've made no progress. You've forgotten all of your progress. Hence the term memoryless. And Poisson processes, even though they are actually working in continuous time, you can view geometric random variables as being discrete time. The number of flips, that's a discrete thing. Uh, Poisson processes are working in continuous time, but they are also memoryless. In fact, uh, in the next chapter, chapter 4, when we're talking about continuous random variables... Oh, it looks like I saved it. Uh, when we're talking about continuous random variables, we're going to see the random variable that describes the time between jumps in Poisson processes. That random variable is called exponential which actually looks and behaves a lot like geometric random variables. Uh, it's kind of the continuous analog of geometric random variables. Okay, I have talked for way too long. Um, anyway, we know that the distribution of the jump between x1 and x0.5 is a Poisson distribution with parameter uh, 10 times 1 minus 0.5. which is, uh, we'll, we'll just go ahead and simplify that right now and say that it's going to be a Poisson random variable with parameter 5. So we want to know what is the probability that x1 minus x0.5 is uh, more than 3. So that's strictly greater than 3. And this is equal to, because this is equal in distribution, to so this is equal in distribution to uh, x 0 
So this is equal, so the probability that x1 minus x0.5 is greater than 3 is equal to the probability that x0.5 is greater than 3 as well. And that is going to be uh, 1 minus the probability that, no, oh, let's not put it there because we're going to run out of room. Uh, this is equal to the probability that x0.5 um, or 1 minus the probability that x0.5 is less than or equal to 3. And for that, we can uh, go to R and compute that probability. So we got 1 minus P poise. Uh, and this is going to be 3 lambda equals 5. So that's 0 0.735 when we round to three decimal places. So this is going to be approximately uh, 0 0.735. Let's erase all that stuff down here because it's not, not even really easy to read. It's such a mess. All right, next part. What is the probability that in two games your daughter's team will score between 15 and 18 points inclusively. So this is for, so now the random variable that we're studying is x2. And the distribution of x2 is going to be a Poisson distribution uh, with parameter 20, 2 times 10, because t is equal to 2. Uh, so the probability that uh, 15 is less than or equal to x2, which is less than or equal to uh, 18, will be the CDF of x2 at 18 minus the CDF of x2 at uh, 15 minus 1, which at this point, I'm just going to say that's 14. All right, we'll ask R what that is. So P poise uh, at 18, lambda equals 20, uh, minus P poise at 14, lambda equals 20 is 0. 277. We'll say 0 0.277. So this is approximately 0 0.277. Okay. All right. I created a function poiproc that is supposed to uh, give you the uh, probability mass function of a Poisson process at time t. So uh, I created a random variable representing the process at x1, x, at x half, and x2. So using this uh, discrete RV R package. So I created plots of their probability mass functions respectively. And uh, and uh, I computed the probabilities that we were interested in, such as the probability that x1 is equal to 7. Uh, that is something that we were able to get. Uh, the probability that, that the process at, at half time is equal to 2. The probability that the process is greater than or equal to 3 and less than or equal to 6. This corresponds to 3 less than or equal to x1, which is less than or equal to 6 because of the AND operator. These should be agreeing with what we have before. Uh, we have the probability that x half is greater than 3, which is corresponding to part 4. Uh, and of course, that's uh, because what the thing that we actually want a probability for is equal in distribution to the value of the process at half time. And then we got this other part too. All right. So um, something interesting about Poisson random variables is that Poisson random, this is the first time we're going to see one random variable being used to approximate another random variable. I mentioned that we were doing that uh, when talking about the binomial random variable in a, in a situation where 
there was a finite population, but the population was large enough and the number of successes in the population was large enough that we could basically ignore the fact that we are not sampling independently. Uh, in this situation, we're actually going to use that approximation, uh, like more consciously use that approximation. It turns out that Poisson random variables can be used to approximate the binomial distribution. Uh, so the Poisson distribution approximates the binomial distribution when n is large and p is small. Now, Poisson random variables are uh, parameterized by their mean, and binomial random variables are parameterized by, n to, by the sample size and the probability p, but you can get the mean of a binomial random variable by multiplying n and p, and at the very least, your approximation for your binomial random ver for your binomial random variable should agree in mean like they should have the same mean therefore it's natural that the poisson random variable with mean parameter n times p is going to that would be what you'd use to approximate uh the binomial random variable with parameters n and p and i'm not really saying in what sense that they're approximate but we can say at the very least that the that the probability mass functions are very similar to each other. Uh, they're numerically close. And the numerical approximation gets even better the, when uh, you have large n and small p. All right. So this is a large n small p situation. This mattered more back when software was more difficult, computers were not as accessible and not as fast as they are now. And people were doing probability largely from uh, tables and books. That's when this type of approximation mattered more. These days, I can't really, like, people are, this is more academically interesting than practical. Uh, that said, we'll, we'll still use it. So based off of this, use the Poisson approximation to estimate the CDF of the binomial uh, random variable with, param with uh, parameters uh, 200 and 0.01. I wanted CDF at four. Okay, so uh, let's say that X is going to be this random variable. So it's going to be a binomial random variable uh, with parameters um, 200 and 0 0.1, no, 0 0.01, 200 and 0 0.01. Okay, so X, is approximately equal in distribution. <laughs> this is not a re really a term, but we're just gonna use it for now. To the random variable y, which is following a Poisson distribution uh, with parameter n times p, so 20 times 0.01, which is two. Okay, so if that's the case, um, the, the value of the CDF of this random variable x at four is approximately equal to the value of the CDF of the random variable Y at four as well. Okay, let's uh, get the CDF of the Poisson random variable. So P poise at four when its mean parameter is two. So 0 0.947. So this is approximately 0 0.947. All right, so like I said, this is this was more useful back when you couldn't just do this. P binom uh, for size equals 200 prob equals 0 0.01. Like it was back, it, so this was more useful back when you couldn't just do that. I, and just ask, all right, what is it for the binomial? Although you can see, oh look, those are in fact really close to each other. Those two numbers are actually rather close. So it's a, it's a decent approximation. I'm not really showing this to you for the sake of you using this in the real world. I'm showing this to you because the fact that some random variables approximate other ones is an interesting and important fact. Uh, um, we're going to see actually more uh, random, variable, random variable approximations later on. Uh, 
including another one for the binomial random variable. But the fact that some random variables approximate others is a very important fact. Another thing that I should mention, uh, well, I think I'll talk about this later, but if you add two independent Poisson random variables, the result is another Poisson random variable. So maybe you remember me mentioning from a previous lecture video that when you get when you add random variables together to get other random variables, that's important. Poisson random variables fall into that class. So there so it turns out that Poisson random variables, if you add independent Poisson random variables, what you get is another Poisson random variable. Okay. Why you care about that? I'm just going to save that for uh, chapter five. But it's a thing. All right. That is the conclusion of chapter three. Chapter three introduced some basic ideas behind random variables, but started out with the discrete random variables. One thing that's nice about the discrete random variables is that discrete random variables are pretty easy to interpret. Like, for example, the binomial is the number of successes out of uh, uh, so many trials, so many Bernoulli trials. Bernoulli itself is like a coin flip result. You get one for heads and zero for tails. Uh, geometric, I think, is pretty easy to interpret. It's the number of times you flip a coin until you get heads. Hypergeometric, uh, negative binomial, pretty easy to interpret. Uh, the Poisson is probably the more exotic of what we've seen so far. And it's not entirely clear from its formula how it, why it's showing up that way. Like a lot of the probably mass functions we saw, we could very easily reason about uh, using at most the counting tools and pretty much the stuff that we saw from chapter two. The stuff that we saw from chapter two could be used to reason about them. When we move on to continuous random variables, that's not going to be the case. They're not as easy to interpret. I have interpretations for them, but that's that's also because I'm more familiar with limiting results that produce them because they're continuous. So that's an unfortunate thing. And that's largely, uh, that's a good reason to start out probability students with discrete random variables over continuous. But we're going to move on to continuous. And the good news is that a lot of the stuff that we learn transfer over, basically what you need to remember is uh, instead of probability mass functions, you have continuous probability density functions. And, well, okay, they don't have to be continuous, but they're continuous at, at most points. And instead of sums, you have integrals. And that's the difference. That is the difference. Oh, and also that uh, due to the fact that prob that sums are replaced with integrals, you actually don't really care about uh, less than or less than or equal to anymore because the probability of being equal to the point is zero. So, all right. Uh, I will see you in chapter four when we are talking about such random variables. I'll see you then.